now, uh, since we all love meteorites. And I think that's just great. And that's something I really liked about uh, Topher with his uh, arranging his meetups. And uh, I think this is great uh, for science. And I think this is great for all of us. So thanks for having me, Topher. No problem, man. We are, we're honestly uh, joined. We're, we're really glad you joined. And I apologize. Uh, I'm going to roll it back about 30 seconds because luckily someone just let me know that we had not been recording. So I'm going to reintroduce our special guest and then we're going to take it from there. So I apologize for anyone who's live right now who's going to listen to me again. But we are very honored to have uh, with the Meteorite Club uh, hangout on June 3rd, 2020, uh, Mr. Daniel Sheik. Daniel Shake, I'm sorry. Daniel Shake is a um, currently currently a PhD student in geochemistry at Florida State University. At uh, at our request, he's he's honored us with his presence and also his presentation. Um, and we've asked him to kind of fill in the gaps of of what goes on behind the scenes, classification and scientific wise. Um, when a meteorite is given over for classification. So the, the two uh, points that I'm interested in that I asked Daniel to touch on were not only what happens with the complete procedure and, and classification, like when you say microprobe, we have no idea what that is. Explain it to us. Um, when, and then also I wanted to know what got you down this path? What started your journey towards dedicating your academic life and your and your career to the study of meteorites and uh, the, the geosciences. So with that, I apologize and take it over, Daniel. Thank you. Thank you, Topher. So I'm going to begin by first giving just a brief outline as to how I'm going to arrange this sort of uh, setting. I'm personally not a fan of talks. You know, uh, I, I prefer more of a informal sort of setting. So I don't put any text on any of my slides. I just put photos. And if I were to give the same lecture twice, it would probably go in two different directions. But uh, however it goes today, I'm sure we'll all enjoy it. And so I've decided to separate into three main parts. The first is just a brief introduction of how I sort of got into meteorite geochemistry or how I sort of fell in love with it per se and how I got my first meteorite classified. So this is more so leading up into how I got into undergrad, grad school, and how it led to me getting my first meteorite approved. The second part, I'm actually gonna go in depth on the meteorite classification process as a whole. This is starting from the point where I receive a sample from a collector and all the way until it, I receive approval from the nomenclature committee that's in the database and when it's published. So it's gonna be that whole stretch. Uh, I'm gonna go, a little bit scientific on certain parts. Topher is mentioning uh, the scanning electron microscope, describing that process, describing the electron microprobe. I'm not gonna go too far into specific things within certain meteorite groups. I'm sort of gonna go into it as a procedure, but if anyone has any questions on the specifics of a certain meteorite group in regards to the classification process, uh, I'll be glad to take your questions on that or if you wanna message me about that after. And then the last part, I'm gonna dedicate a lot of time just for questions and answers. And this is mostly sort of uh, not just directed towards me, but I guess towards everyone as a whole, since uh, there's a lot of things that I think each of us know really well. And I think it would be great that a great learning experience for all of us, uh, since I'm sure we all have questions about meteorites in one way or another. So that's going to be the last part of uh, this. And I'm going to start by showing you an image uh, for those of you that know where this is uh, and for those of you that don't know where this is this is a uh, garden of the garden of the gods in colorado springs it's a very beautiful area to go to and this is actually where i went and this is sort of how i fell in love with geology per se i was 10 years old i went with my mom my dad my brother we went here and while they were too busy looking up at all the wonderful structures i was too busy looking at the ground fitting as many rocks and minerals as I can in my pocket. Because I absolutely, just like I'm sure a lot of you, I absolutely loved collecting rocks and collecting minerals and just keeping them with me and just hoarding them and having a large collection. But it really wasn't until, I'd say, when I was a, going into university that I really thought about what I wanted to do with my life. You know, I liked rocks, I liked minerals, but 
I thought maybe geology would be interesting. So I gave that a try. And at the time when I first, uh, when I first applied to University of Florida and got into their geology program, I, I, I wasn't really, not to say that I wasn't interested in meteorites, but at the time I, I didn't know whether to focus in geochemistry or geophysics or structural geology, since geology is a very, it's an interdisciplinary subject of biology, chemistry, and physics, but in itself, it has a lot of subjects within its own. So even though, for example, uh, I went to the Museum of Natural History and I saw a lot of meteorites there and I liked that and I, in my senior year of high school, I purchased my first ever meteorite sample, which was a five gram uh, part slice of tenum. And the reason I purchased that actually was because uh, I saw some article online that said that the most abundant mineral on the earth has been found in this meteorite. So I had to have it because I was collecting all sorts of rocks at the time. And so when I got into the university, meteorites weren't my focus at the time. I was sort of open to anything. And it wasn't until I actually stumbled across uh, a very Familiar book, I'm sure, to a lot of you, uh, the Cambridge Encyclopedia of Meteorites. I was just in a library doing some homework, and I happened to just see it in the shelf. I took it down. I started reading it, and then I became fascinated with the term chondrite. I thought that was a very unusual term. I'd never heard of that word before uh, at the time. This was about four years ago. And, you know, I looked in the pages, and I saw they were talking about chondrules, and I thought those are really cool. So I was searching online, like, anyone would. And I came across this YouTube lecture by Dr. Derek Sears. Uh, he, uh, for those of you that know, uh, Derek Sears was, I believe he worked with uh, the SETI Institute with NASA. And I believe he also worked at University of Arkansas. Don't quote me on this, but I know that he's done a lot of work with NASA. And he's done a lot of work in particular, uh, both with uh, doing thermoluminescence and cathaluminescence work on meteorite samples and also doing a lot of work on chondrules. So I, I became fascinated after hearing his lecture and him talking about chondrules and chondrites and this and that. And I wanted to learn more about it. And I was doing more research into, uh, you know, the science behind meteorites because at this time uh, in my university, no, no faculty member was doing anything meteorite related at all. You know, mostly everyone was doing igneous petrology or, uh, most of the staff were seismologists, so they were doing geophysics work or they were doing um, hydrogeology. So there wasn't anyone in the faculty I could talk to. So I was doing a lot of my research online. And something I wanted to do was I, I sort of wanted to look at a meteorite myself. And when I got to UF, I was involved in some research projects using the standing electron microscope. So I had access to it and I was using it uh, sort of as assisting other people in their research at the time. And I was learning about it, but I never really used it personally. And so I figured, you know, I had a meteorite sample of Tenum and why not look at a meteorite under the SEM? So I took the Tenum slice and I put it under the SEM. I inserted it in and I started imaging everything I saw. So a couple images on the right, you'll see there's a, that's a, a barred olivine chondral. And on the bottom is mostly an overview. So if I, you were to zoom out and you were just to take a picture of Tenum as a whole, you would see something like this. Now Tenum, for those of you that don't know, it's an, it's an L6, but it's also, so it's, it's, it's heavily recrystallized per se. So there's not really many chondrules you see because it's been heated metamorphically from thermal metamorphism on its parent body. It's also been heavily shocked. So Tenum isn't really the best meteorite to look at if you want to just take pictures of chondrules, but at that time I didn't know. So that barred olivine looks awesome. It's a beautiful one. Uh, you can actually see that the um, that there is no mesostasis material. It all okay. devitrified, and then it later recrystallized to form secondary plagioclase. So that's sort of those lats right there, those dark lats. That's plagioclase material, and then in between those lats are actually olivine. Yeah, stick it up. That's cool. So it's. It's a, it's, it's a beautiful chondro, at least that I managed to find, and a meteorite that doesn't really contain chondrules. So that's was something oh, nice. Yeah, the win. And so I, did, I also went online and I figured out there was a meteoritical society. So this was a group of cosmochemists and scientists and 
a lot of meteorite uh, people that work together and they sort of do uh, sort of they present re you present research at these conferences on meteorites and I decided that I wanted to attend I was also going into my senior year of college so this was my last year of undergrad and I wanted to go to grad school and find a professor that I could work with on meteorites so I decided that going to this conference would be a good idea to sort of sort of as outreach and sort of as to hopefully find a professor that I might be able to talk to and maybe apply to the university that they work at and hopefully do research with them for grad school. So I, so I made an abstract for this conference. Uh, it's really bad. If you search my name up and you search this abstract, you'll find it. Um, at the time, of course, I was just taking images of chondrules and doing a basic EDS analysis of the entire chondral. So scientifically, there's nothing you can really get from the study I did. It was just more so that I had something to show and some place I could go to to uh, collaborate and meet with other scientists and hopefully find an advisor for graduate school. So I attended the Meteorical Society meeting. I was in Santa Fe. I was there the whole week. And um, I met with a lot of very interesting people. Uh, I met uh, Dr. Alan Rubin, Dr. Karen Siegler, who ran the whole events, Dr. Carl Agee, and many others. And there was one person in particular that I remember. Uh, uh, for those of you that remember uh, the late uh, Fred Olson, uh, Fred was there. And incidentally, Fred actually noticed my poster because I was the only student there from, from UF. Fred actually, for those of you that don't know Fred Olson, uh, he was a UF alumni. He got his bachelor's and his master's there in paleontology. And he noticed the Gator logo I had on my poster. So that was interesting. And he came up to me and he saw that I was an undergrad getting into the science. And he told me that he would send me any samples I needed and he would support me. And he was very nice. And without his support, I, I probably wouldn't uh, be where I'm at today. That's awesome. So, so a lot of, so I was really glad that I attended this conference because if I didn't, I probably wouldn't have gone into meteorites. And it's great when you have uh, a large number of people that you meet. And Dr. Alan Rubin in particular, I'm not sure how many of you uh, have spoken with him that much, but he was actively trying to introduce me to people and get me to know others. And I'm gonna speak more about him later since uh, uh, he's helped me a lot in meteorite classification as well. So, but in general, uh, for any of you that might be interested in attending these sorts of conferences, you don't have to know a lot of science. I mean, I really, didn't know anything when I went to these lectures. I was hearing students talk and hearing professors talk and I didn't know anything. But eventually, you know, there's so much out there online that you can read and there's so many books that you can ed self educate yourself on on meteorites. And there's still so much every day that I learned that I really don't know. So it's a great conference and I recommend anyone to attend this if possible. And so um, after that, uh, I mainly was just using the scanning electron microscope during my last year at UF. I was just imaging chondrules and I was applying to universities. I got into uh, Florida State University, uh, Dr. Munir Humayun. Uh, he picked me as a student and he was interested that I was doing work as an undergrad uh, with chondrules. And so I got accepted to FSU and I attended LPSC 49, that's the image of me right there. And I presented another poster. I was basically on this website I made where I put chondrules up. I called it the chondro database. Uh, that abstract is still online. Again, it wasn't any, it I, wasn't any. I think that's the one that I have on my hard drive. As soon as I saw it online, I was like, I need this. And then I, ha I, I have it available. Anytime I'm on my microscope, I pull up that exact slide and I've shared it several times in the meteorite club. So yes, oh, really? oh. <laughs> it's still online and still being, still being used actively. Huh. Well, I, the Condro, the Condro database, is that, you mean that website? Is that the one you're no, talking about? Or? The, the slide. Oh, this slide. Okay. No, the, uh, the slide with the, with the different chondral types. Oh, I see. It's a, it's a very, very useful. But, um, so I, so I presented at LPSC and shortly after that, the good thing is once I got into graduate school, even though I was still 
finishing my undergrad degree at the time. Uh, Dr. Humayun was putting me in contact with, since he had a lot of contacts in the, the community, so he was putting me in contact with uh, Dr. Tony Irving. He was putting me in contact with Dr. Steve B. Simon and with many other uh, colleagues of his. And one of the things that I actually was thinking about at the time uh, was I was saying with a lot of these samples, these chondrules were from, I had to go on this website called the Meteoritical Bulletin to search, you know, just what sort of meteorite it was. And, and so that way I knew where these chondro images were coming from because I was getting samples from Fred at the time and he gave me an NWA number, but I didn't really know what sort of sample it was. So I was having access looking at that website and eventually I decided, you know, why not maybe try to classify or get a meteorite on there myself. And one of the other people that I met at, one of the, uh, a person I met at LPSC also that year was Dr. Uh, Lawrence, uh, uh, sorry, Dr. Jeffrey Grossman. And he was very friendly and he was telling me about uh, the database system and how it works. And I decided, I sent him a message and I said, if I'd like to get my own meteorite on there, what's the right process to do? So I messaged him, I messaged Dr. Tony, Tony Irving, I messaged Dr. Steve V. Simon, I messaged Dr. Alan Rubin, and I got a lot of feedback sort of telling me what the process is and how to exactly, once you have a sample that you get, so for example, this meter right here that I'm showing, uh, what steps do I need to follow to get it into the database and what sort of chemical analysis do I need to do? So before I go into that, a little backstory on this sample right here. Uh, again, I was going on eBay since, you know, at the time I wasn't a member of these Facebook groups on meteorites. So eBay was my only, you know, source for finding meteorites. And I don't know who the seller is. Uh, I don't know if anyone knows Ore Digger 51 Does anyone know that seller? Yes. Um, Derek Fisher. Well, uh, if, it, if, it, if it wasn't for Derek, then I would not have been able to get this meteorite. This meteorite is NWA11838. It's a heavily weathered sample. It's, you can see it's really fractured. And I bought it on eBay. It's about two and a half kilos. And I decided that I wanted to classify it since it was unclassified at the time. So I uh, used a oil saw and I cut it into many pieces. This is just one of the pieces. I'm sorry if it looks bad to some of you. I'm not really good when it comes to cutting meteorites. And I'm I took, surprised it stayed together. <laughs> yeah, I know. This was, the, this was actually the luckiest piece that stayed intact. Most of the pieces, when I cut them, they just broke apart. Yeah. So I was very fortunate enough to even have this piece. So, but if you see on the bottom, you can actually see a lot of other pieces. I pretty much took one that looked uh, the most flat and I did a little bit of a polish with some sandpaper, but I didn't really polish it that well. And one of the big sort of, one of the big rules you don't want to break whenever you're putting a sample in an SEM is you do not, you, under no circumstances do you want it to not be flat because anything that's not flat is going to affect the image quality a lot. And so what I did was I took, a, I took the most flat piece I could find. It wasn't that much polished either. I stuck it in the SEM just like I did with Tenum the year before. And these are a couple images. And as you could see, uh, if you've seen pictures of SEM images of meteorites and books, it does not look that clean. It's messy and that's because it's not flat and well polished. But thankfully, uh, you're still able to at least sort of discern some of the mineral phases. I'll go into that a bit later during the classification procedure, how to actually tell the phases. But I was very fortunate enough to uh, hit some points using the EDS. So I hit some olivines, hit some pyroxenes. Uh, I was at least able to see some, some plagiar clay so I can get a sense as to the petrologic type. And so I did all the chemical analysis. And then the next step was I needed to send a piece of the meteorite to a type specimen repository. So I didn't know what that term meant. So I, I asked uh, uh, Dr. Grossman and he told me it needs to go to an institute that curates meteorites. So the first place I contacted was UNM. Uh, I didn't get a response from them. So then I contacted UCLA and uh, Dr. Alan Rubin responded and he said I could send him some of the sample. 
So I was technically only supposed to send 20%. I think I sent like 60% of the meteorite there, but I just wanted to make sure they had enough material mm -hmm. uh, for it. So, and basically I submitted also, I submitted the form to the meteorological bulletin uh, nomenclature committee. I'll go into that form later on during the process, but I submitted the form, submitted the type specimen. And incidentally, uh, the last course that I needed to finish for my undergrad degree was field camp. As a, if you're a geology major, uh, you pretty much have to do what's called a field camp course where they take you to the field and you do a lot of uh, structural work and so and so and geologic mapping. And so the day before I left for field camp, I submitted this, uh, I submitted my form to METBOL. And so basically every day uh, when we weren't camping and there was no signal, whenever we were on the road, I just kept checking my email looking for statuses and I didn't hear anything for about four weeks. And then one day, uh, I got this message from Dr. Grossman and I saw the approval for my first meteorite and a couple of days later it was online. That's awesome. And Congrats, that's, man. That was the story for the, the first one. Wow. And incidentally, this is actually the only meteorite uh, that I have approved under University of Florida. Since every meteorite after that, I was already graduated. Mm -hmm. So UF only has one meteorite under their names, but every other meteorite I've done was with FSU. So. Wow. The beginning, huh? I actually, at the time, I only wanted to have one meteorite approved. I just wanted to have my name in there. I, I wasn't really thinking ahead at having more meteorites. So I just wanted to have one of them and, I just wanted to have, you know, you know, like how everyone wants to have a sample that you can claim to your name, such oh. as if you're a hunter and you find a piece of a meteorite or you're a collector and you got it classified and you're the main mass holder. I sort of wanted to have that sort of feeling. Yeah. So, you're, you're talking to a bunch of people oh, yeah. who live and breathe it like, oh, am I a co-mass holder? Yeah, sweet. <laughs> yeah, we know. <laughs> So it was an amazing feeling, I'll tell you that. That, that made up for the entire uh, field camp. To be honest, I am not an outdoors person, so I prefer working in a laboratory, inside, and camping was not my type of thing. So this really brightened up the trip, I'll tell you that's that. That's awesome. And, and that's one thing that I share with a lot of people, Daniel, is how you know one of the things that gives the meteorite value and the value is not monetarily always, but the value is the story. So. You have a story behind this one, and I'm sure you value that way more than it's actually worth, you know, which is way cool. And this meteorite itself, it's, 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 just, um, it's just an L6. It's yeah. just like any equilibrated chondrite that you see on the market. Yeah. It's a it's high weathering four. Oh, you can yeah. tell things crack in half. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not the prettiest sample, I'll yeah. tell you that. Yeah. But it's official, and we love it. <laughs> And so that's the story of how I got my first meteorite classified. And now I'm going to go into describing the process. So I think the number one thing when actually, before I go into this, I think, you know, there's so much research online that talks about, uh, like if you see a lot of um, papers, I think uh, the most recent was, was from Dr. Sasha Krote. It was a 2014 paper where he discussed uh, the different meteorite groups and how they're classified. And there's been many papers in Weisberg 2006 and any book that you open up on meteorites shows all the different groups and everything, atlas of meteorites, meteorites and thin sections, uh, encyclopedia of meteorites, you know, any book, you name it. But the thing it doesn't really talk about is the process of getting it into the database. And that's sort of something you have to ask people and it's not really the easiest thing to communicate. So I'm going to do my best to communicate the process step by step. And uh, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to jump in. And uh, I'm going to start by sort of showing the, so the first step is when the collector sends me the sample. So on the left image, this was a sample. Uh, I'm not going to say which meteorite it was until the end, but basically a collector sent me this sample and the first thing that needs to be done when I get it is if it's already cut, so if it's already sliced, then I always ask for the type specimen. 
So, so basically, um, the type specimen represents either 20% of the entire mass of the meteorite or 20 grams, whichever is less. So if you, found, if you have an 80 gram meteorite, uh, you need to send 20% of that uh, to a type specimen repository to get it classified. If you have something that's over 100 grams, you just need to send 20 grams. So in this case, his, uh, his sample was, I think, um, I think it was about 20 grams, something like that. So he sent me about uh, 4.2 grams. And he also sent me a very small piece as well, a very thin slice to, to get a thin section made out of. So usually another thing I always ask for is a small slice or small piece separate from the type specimen to get a thin section made out of. And the reason why I want it separate from the type specimen and not just making a thin section out of the type specimen is because a lot of times uh, when I send off the sample to get a thin section made, uh, when it returns, it weighs less than 20% of the sample. So then all of a sudden I have to ask for more material, otherwise it won't be classified. It won't be accepted into the repository. So I always ask for a little bit more just in case to guarantee that they won't, the collector won't have to send more of the sample. Now your so, request makes a lot more sense to me. And there's nothing wrong with just sending 20.00 grams, but another problem with that, which is I think sometimes, uh, I think sometimes I say 20.2 grams, 20.3, sometimes up to 21 is because different, uh, different, uh, of course, different institutions have different types of scales. So something that might weigh 20.01 grams on my scale might weigh 19.98 on theirs. So it's just to make sure that there's no issues between institutions, the weight is enough to fit the type specimen requirement. And that's sort of why I ask for a little more material. Yeah. So the next thing I do is I take the thin section slice that is sent to me and I mail it off to get a thin section made. I've tried making thin sections before and I'm not really the best at it. And uh, Tony Irving actually recommended to me this service called Spectrum Petrographics. They pretty much make, I think, all, all if not most of his thin sections, especially his Martian meteorites. And last week, Neil showed you a lot of uh, uh, thin section images of uh, Tony's Martian meteorites. And a lot of those, those thin sections were made by Spectrum Petrographics. They make very high yes. quality thin sections. So I, I highly recommend them if anyone wants to have a thin section made. So I always send the thin section slice to them. Do you ask for double polish all the time? They do what's called a, you can ask for double polished. What I always ask for is uncovered uh, EMPA polish, so electron microprobe analysis polished sample. And what they do is they do what's called uh, epoxy impregnation. So they put the sample in a vacuum chamber they put epoxy on it and then they, they, and so what that does is when they make the thin section, there are no air bubbles trapped because they, they do that in a vacuum. I, I, I don't know the specifics too well, but it's called vacuum impregnation. And so the thin sections, when they, they come out, they're very pristine. You don't see bubbles in them and they do a really good job polishing. You can request custom orders. So uh, their thin sections normally come 30 microns thick. Uh, you can request, let's say, if you want to do uh, 100 micron section, thick section or something like that, you can request that. They have all sorts of requests you can make. You can, I think, request multiple samples per slide. You can request one inch rounds. Um, and you can request uh, slides that are covered. You can request all sorts of things. Uh, they have a full list on their website. And you can also request how long you want the thin section to be made. So normally it takes about six weeks to be made. It's $45. Uh, you can pay 35 and it takes 10 weeks, or you can pay 135 and it takes one week. So it depends how fast you need the thin section. So for example, as of now, when I, when I'm, I have samples to send to them to get thin sections made, uh, I'm probably just going to do the standard six week or 10 week. But in the past, when I've had some urgent orders uh, to get a thin section made ASAP to do a quick classification, then I do one or two weeks. So it's up to the collector to decide how soon they want the sample to be classified, which determines how long uh, the thin section making time would take by the company, which I would tell them. So it's more of a, it's more of a collaborative sort of thing. 
Do they also make the great big two by three inch slides? And are those used in classification? Two by three, um, that I don't know. Um, the one Neil had was a two by two Martian knockout. I think you can request you can request custom slide si sizes. I think because um, because I know they do the one inch rounds and they do the standard uh, thin section size. I'm sure I'm pretty positive that they have customizations, but that's probably something you might want to ask them. Yeah, I, I, there is a standard that's somewhere around two inches by three inches uh, for the for bigger slide. Okay, thank you. So while the sample's sent off, because since, like I said, it takes about six weeks to do it. So as soon as I get the samples from the collectors, I always try to send them out ASAP because, you know, for six weeks, you're not really doing anything. You're just waiting on the thin sections. So what I like to do in the meantime is with the hand sample, I do two things. The first is I look at it under my stereoscope, which, um, by the way, this is the same stereoscope that last year, uh, I made a GoFundMe for, and a lot of you donated to it. So thank you for everyone who donated. And I use that to sort of look at the sample, assess the weathering grade of the sample. I see, is there um, iron nickel metal in there? Are there sulfides? And is there any uh, oxide alteration, uh, other things? So I mainly use it to assess weathering, but I can also just take a quick look at the meteorite and see, you know, does it have chondrules? Does it not? What sort of texture does the hand sample have? So I just do a little basic uh, uh, physical sample uh, identification. And then the second thing I do, which is actually pretty cool, uh, I got this back in October. This is a magnetic susceptibility meter on the left, this orange box. And uh, Jerome Gattaseka actually recommended this to me. He does a lot of work on magnetic susceptibility work on chondrites and other research at Serage Institute in uh, France. And he recommended me to a colleague of his that actually produces these instruments. And they have very uh, a good sensitivity. And so I was actually looking to buy one before this one. It's called the SM30. And that one is about 1400 to 1500 So it's a little pricey. Wow. And so the thing is, when you, when you're, you have to do what's called mass corrections when you analyze a lot of uh, the meteorite sample. So you have to do corrections for its mass and the shape of it as well. But with this specific instrument, you actually don't have to worry about the mass or the shape at all. It's configured in a way where you just put it on top of, uh, of the fusion crust of any sample, so an individual. And then you just scan it. It gives you magnetic susceptibility and it also gives you electrical conductivity. So this is really cool for identifying terrestrial from meteorite samples. So this is something that you can do as well. And then you, on that knob right there, basically you set it according to its estimated mass. So you can weigh it. If it's about 20 grams, you set it to 20 grams and it gives you a mass normalized uh, log X value. So for its magnetic susceptibility and then its electrical conductivity on the bottom. So you can get both. Uh, there are plots that uh, Jerome has that he sent to me and the meteorite groups are all on there, but. For the most part, magnetic susceptibility uh, is what I use. It's, it's pretty useful for the most part when you're trying to distinguish between H's, L's, and LL's, especially with falls, since, uh, since with falls, it's a lot easier to tell the groups apart. With NWA fines, when they're weathered, it, it makes it a little complicated, but it's still pretty useful because you can put this over uh, you know, small 20 gram, 30 gram individuals that you haven't cut open, and it gives you a pretty good sense as, am I looking at an L or H? Oh, well, so it's good that's for fantastic. those. So it's, yeah, th it's that's like we, we all have our, our own favorite self-calibrated rare earth magnet that only we know. <laughs> so this is like the actual scientific delivery of that. That's awesome. It's basically the same, the same thing. For with, with electric conductivity too. It's only good What's though. What's the cost of it? The cost of it, it's about uh, yeah. 450. So it's, it's a pretty wow. good it's a pretty good amount less than the SM30. Cool. And if you, let, me, let me see your picture of it, Pat, when you buy it next week. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is to get it though, it's a little complicated. So um, uh, I have the email address of the person who makes these. She lives in France. And the thing was shipping it to the U S was a little complicated because um, 
when they manufacture this, uh, they don't, it's, it's not necessarily something that can be used outside of education purposes. So the only way I was able to get this was um, someone, there was the AGU conference in December. So they, so people from that university went down there and they were able to ship it from the States to me. So it's, it's pretty hard to get that internationally, but uh, if there's any conferences in the future, um, you can probably do the same thing if you're interested in this, or I think she can ship it to you internationally, but there's a pretty hefty fee with that. So I wanted it not as expensive. So that's why I just got it from someone who was in the States that came from France, but it's a very cool instrument and uh, the battery life is actually really good. So it, it's very small too. It looks a lot bigger, but it's, it's a very small cube. It's only maybe an inch and a half. It's sort of like a, uh, almost like a cubic inch and a half on, on, for the most part, volume. So it's a really good size. So that's what I mostly do uh, while I'm waiting for the thin section. Once I get the thin section back, then I use my, um, my petrographic scope. So I, I have an Optica uh, B150 Polarize, polar P-O-L, and it's, it's not the most expensive polarizing microscope. It's, um, it's a very basic one, but it does the job pretty well. Unfortunately, when I bought it last year, I wasn't thinking about taking images with a Trinoc scope. So I didn't buy the Trinoc one, even though I probably should have. So that's something I'd like to save up for in the future. Uh, also one probably that has reflected light as well, since reflected light is really useful to have as well as polarizing light in the same When scale. that becomes a reality, put the GoFundMe on the, Met, uh, on the Meteorite Club page or let me know and I will post it for you, my friend. Thank you so much, Stelfer. Thank you. Seriously, yes, do it. So the only images I have of my thin sections are uh, when I put my phone camera in one of the, the two ocular uh, lenses. So you see all these spheres, but basically, um, so, so once I get the thin section, I take a look at it in PPL and XPL. Uh, plain polarized light is, uh, it, it's, sort of the, it's sort of the main function of these polarizing microscopes, but uh, cross-polarized light or XPL, which we call that, that's sort of where everything sort of comes to life. So yeah, uh, Daniel, I'm going to ask that. Um, it, and you know, I I apologize if we have to make this an a, a episode one of two, we will. But um, I want you to idiot proof this for us all. Um, when you use acronyms, sure. Um, explain what they are and exactly how. I mean. If you could, please, because I want to learn as much as possible, and it, I'm going to watch the replay, and I'm and I'm going to have to be googling stuff. So, um, anything you can do to explain, you know, what what the uh, the acronyms are and how it affects the light when you're doing that would be really appreciated. Sure. So, uh, to go back on this, uh, the petrographic microscopes a very useful uh, microscope because. Essentially what it is, is you have a analyzer on the top and you have a condenser on the bottom. And so I'm probably not gonna give the, the best explanation of this since it's still a little bit confusing to me, but basically you have uh, two channels per se of light. And when they interact, uh, when, when they interact uh, the two polarizers, I should say, um, they form, depending on the interaction between uh, those polarizers, whether if they're crossed or whether they're in the same direction, uh, it affects the, it affects essentially the behavior of how the light goes through uh, whatever material you're putting it through. So for example, uh, this in this thin section right here, uh, let's take a look at uh, this chondral on the right. You can see how I've got all these different colors. And that's because I've got different minerals. So for example, I've got olivine, I've got pyroxene, I've got mesostasis material, and then I've got this matrix material in the background. Mm -hmm. And especially with the different mineral phases, because they have different uh, crystalline structures, light passes through them in a different way. And so uh, the interference colors or the color that they show when you're looking at them in uh, under a petrographic microscope, it's going to be different depending on the properties of the mineral 
structure of, of the atomic structure of the mineral itself. So in a nutshell, basically different minerals are going to show for the most part different interference colors. And they're also going to show different behavior as you uh, as you um, rotate uh, the, the, the microscopic stage. And so what I mean by this is uh, if you were rotating the stage while you're looking at the sample under cross polarized light, uh, different minerals would go extinct, which are when the polarizers become aligned. And as you keep rotating them, uh, you would have what's called birefringence where the color changes as you're rotating it. So you go from extinct to showing a color to going back to extinct. And when something's extinct, it appears basically completely dark. So you don't see it. Now, some minerals uh, such as garnet are what we call isotropic, which means when you view them in cross polarized light, they're, they're completely dark the whole way through, which means you can rotate the stage over and over and garnet is gonna stay dark the whole time. Where, and also some other phases are what we call opaque. So for example, iron nickel metal, sulfides like troilite, and in some cases, the matrix of type three chondrites, if, it's very prim if, the, if they're very primitive chondrites, once you look at them under plain polarized light and cross polarized light, regardless of the two, they're always gonna, you're basically not gonna be able to see those phases because they basically appear dark, such as this. So the phases that we're seeing right now for the most part are olivines, pyroxenes, and some other recrystallized material. But what's really cool about using uh, the petrographic scope is that we can basically do a couple things. So the first thing we can do is take a look at the sample and see are the grains zoned. So we can take a look at the olivine grains. And if you take a look at this grain right here, I don't know if you could see my cursor. Does, can everyone see it? Yep. So you can see how here it's sort of a, a yellowish color. And here it gets more red as you go towards the, the per se, the rim of the grain or towards the outside of the grain. This is a good indicator of zonation. It could also be an indicator that, uh, that the meteorite has undergone some shock. And so another useful thing of using uh, the petrographic scope is to be able to find the shock stage of a meteorite. So we can look at different mineral phases like olivine or if plagioclase is present, we can look at that. And we can observe the behavior of the olivine as you rotate the stage. So when a mineral goes to extinction, as it becomes darker, so for example, if you were to rotate the stage, as the mineral would become basically dark and you wouldn't see it anymore, it should do so in a very sharp manner. So it should, you should see the color, you rotate the stage and it goes extinct. And then you rotate again and then you see the color again. When a meteorite has undergone a good amount of shock, and the shock pressures have affected the, the mineral grains, the extinction pattern of the olivines and the pyroxenes changes. And it's not so well-defined anymore. And I wish I had a video to show this. Uh, uh, Alan Rubin has a really great lecture where he shows the shock behavior of these minerals if you search on YouTube. But basically, the olivine starts uh, having what's called undulose extinction, where it doesn't go perfectly extinct in all the same areas. And then in some cases, it has what's called mosaicism, where one specific olivine grain can have different interference colors, and it's basically divided into different domains, and you get all sorts of uh, different effects you observe. So the, the main bottom, the bottom line point uh, regarding using thin sections for meteorites is that they can help uh, you do identification of mineral phases, you can use it for identifying shock in meteorites, and you can also use it for seeing if there's any zonation. And of course, another usefulness in using it with type three chondrites are that if you're trying to get a sense of the subtype. So there's a lot of type three chondrites that are approved in the meteorological bulletin, but only a small percentage of those are actually subtyped into 3.1, 3.2. And one really good thing of being able to get a sort of a sense as to maybe what the subtype might be if it's a low subtype and what I mean by subtype is, for example, uh, Semarcona is a 3.00. What this means is that Semarcona has, it basically has undergone basically almost no amounts of thermal metamorphism or shock metamorph, not, not, sorry, not shock metamorphism, aqueous alteration, or it's undergone very little amounts. So it's what we call pristine meteorite. It's very primitive. 
uh, kept under a certain heat. Like it, it never crosses a certain heat threshold. Is that correct? Basically, as you go from uh, type threes to type sixes, uh, the meteorite on its parent body has undergone ex more extensive thermal metamorphism. Mm -hmm. So when you look at type six meteorites, for example, uh, you can see there's almost no chondrules. You can see all these large uh, recrystallized grains of plagiac clays. And if you were to analyze every single olivine grain, for the most part, they would probably be almost the same composition. Whereas in a type three, you can look in this chondral and you can hit this olivine grain or this olivine grain or this olivine grain, and you can get completely different compositions. Gotcha. Okay. So the advantage of the reason why these type threes are really important, like ask for 094, Simarcona. Uh, the reason why these are such important samples to cosmochemists is because these samples preserve components that survived not just initial accretion in the solar nebula, but these survived thermal metamorphism. These have largely escaped aqueous alteration. And for the most part, uh, Simarcona is a fall, so it's escaped a good amount of weathering as well. Wow. So these are very important meteorites since they tell us a lot, especially with their components. So unaltered since their creation. For the most part, yes. Yes. So that's another cool thing about using the petrographic scope. Even today, uh, there's still a lot about uh, optical mineralogy that's, that's still a little confusing to me. Uh, in mineralogy, if, if you take that or there's online uh, lectures you can find that they teach you using the scope, uh, there's a lot of really helpful uh, guides such as minerals and thin sections, rocks and thin sections. And uh, these tell you a lot about you know, what the color of olivine would be in a thin section and what the color of pyroxene would be. And nowadays, thin section optical microscopy has sort of become almost a lost art where more people are using other instruments and doing isotope work and focusing on the thin section. So it was really good that Neil did a, a PowerPoint last week talking about that. So, So once you get past the thin sections, the next thing to do is to actually do analytical work. And so uh, what, this is the scanning electron microscope at UF. Uh, this was the old one I used at the time. Uh, the one I use now is a little different. It's called a field emission scanning electron microscope. So it's a little more advanced, but I'm just gonna go over very briefly. Well, I'm gonna go over exactly the configuration of how the SEM works and the importance. So. Basically on the bottom right here is a sample chamber. So you put your sample in there. And the first thing you do when you put your sample in and you close it is you have to, you have to set a vacuum setting on the instrument. So most scanning electron microscopes have what's called high vacuum setting, where you, you set up basically a very large vacuum down to 10 to the minus five, minus six millibars. And the reason why you have such a strong vacuum is because uh, with the scanning electron microscope, what you're doing is you're firing electrons at the sample. And it's important you have a strong vacuum because any amount of air in there that you could have or gas or anything uh, can really affect your image quality. It can affect a lot of things. So the main way it works is you put the sample in. So for example, there's an ant right here and you have this electron gun at the top. So that's this right here. And the electron gun is powered by couple of things. One of the things I'm most familiar with is tungsten filament. So you put a filament in and it pretty much, uh, basically what happens is when you use the scanning electron microscope, the beam or the gun fires out a beam of electrons uh, down the column. And so there's a lot of lenses and anodes here that basically focus the beam. But basically the overall, uh, uh, the overall goal is the beam hits the sample. And when the beam of electrons interacts with the specimen, multiple things can happen. So these electrons, they're free electrons. They're interacting with the sample and they can do one of two things. They could hit the sample and they could bounce right back into what's called the backscattered electron detector. So these basically have what's it's sort of an elastic collision almost. So these hit the sample and they bounce directly back. So that's backscattered or they interact with the sample and they actually knock off electrons from within the sample. And those electrons are called secondary electrons and they get picked up in the secondary electron detector. So these are two different ways, uh, these are two different types of detectors on the SEM. 
and the are, significance of are both of them used for meteorics great question so the significance the so the two of them are different because in the case of the secondary electron detector when you're looking at a sample that's not flat that has topography you're going to get all sorts of different interactions between the electrons and the sample depending on of course the sample's topography so in the case of an ant it's not flat so there's many parts of an ant and so the secondary electron detector is really good using for when you have biological samples or when you're trying to look at something that has topography. So if you're trying to look at a dragonfly or a bee or something like that, for the most part, you use secondary electron detector. But for meteorites, because we want them to be extremely flat and polished, uh, the detector that's most appropriate for that is the backscattering electron detector. So that's primarily what we use when we look at meteorites uh, in an SEM. We call them BSE images. Awesome, thank you. Do, do you coat your samples first, carbon coat them? Yes, that's a great question as well. So a lot of times when you put a sample in the SEM, especially if you're doing high vacuum settings, you want to coat your sample because otherwise, a lot of the electrons that hit your sample sometimes stick and you get what's called charging, which is when you get so many electrons concentrated in one place that you can't even see your sample on the computer monitor when you're looking at it. So you have to coat the sample to prevent this charging effect. Usually you can get away with it in low vacuum settings where you don't have to carbon coat your sample. But when you do low vacuum settings, you're, you're giving up image quality and you're also giving up uh, analytical quality as well. So when you're using the EDS detector, which I'll go into a bit later, but basically you wanna coat your samples. So carbon coating is the number one way. And what I have here are backscatter electron images. And the reason why the backscatter electron detector is used also for meteorites is because it has what's called Z contrast. So what that means is if I, I'm gonna jump ahead really quick. Did you say Z or V? Z contrast with a Z. Okay. So the letter Z corresponds to the atomic number. So the atomic number of an element, for example, like, uh, like hydrogen, the atomic number is one because it has one proton. So the atomic number means how many protons an element has. When you're looking at minerals, for, uh, when you're looking at minerals, for example, uh, you, have all sort, you have different elements like olivine, for example, uh, Mg2SiO4 to Fe2SiO4. So you can have different amounts of magnesium, different amounts of iron. In some cases, slight different amounts of silicon. So what the BSE detector does is when those electrons are interacting with, so this is, this is image B right here. When they're interacting with atoms from uh, the olivine grains, uh, they're, basically, they're basically being influenced by uh, whatever atom they're hitting. So in this case, they're going around the nucleus and they're shot back out. That's what backscatter means. They're shot back into the detector. And when you have different elements, so for example, when you have an iron atom or if you have a magnesium atom, the behavior of these electrons are gonna behave differently. And when you have minerals that contain a whole bunch of elements with a whole bunch of atoms, uh, you're gonna get what's called an average atomic number. So what this means is if you took the average atomic number of olivine, took the average atomic number of pyroxene, of plagioclase, of metal, of troilite, uh, you're gonna get roughly a different number. And that number is gonna have an influence on the color of the mineral. And so what I mean by this is when the backscatter electron detector picks up these electrons that are scattered back at it, it turns that into an image. And the colors on the image are representative of the average atomic number of whatever you're hitting. So in this case, for example, this phase right here with this color, so it's sort of a medium grayish color, this is olivine. So olivine in this sample has this color. Pyroxene, you can see this, uh, this uh, grain right here is a little darker in color. This is a grain of pyroxene. So pyroxene, uh, because it has a slightly smaller uh, atomic num average atomic number than olivine does, it appears a little darker. And plagioclase feldspar, because it has a smaller atomic uh, number or smaller Z 
than olivine and pyroxene, it appears even more darker. So this is and sort of- is the, is the, the darkness dependent on the delta between them all? So the, so the, yes, so the color actually, so basically you get a grayscale sort of range between the phase with the highest Z and the phase with the lowest Z. And so in this case, for example, the highest phase right here, which is the brightest phase, this is troilite. So troilite here has the highest Z and plagioclase here has the lowest Z. Now it's not the same in every sample you hit. So when you get at, to- At that the, stage, are you looking at the various um, uh, equilibrations on the olivines? Yes. So all you had mentioned there, you know, you know, if you're at a higher uh, petrology stage, you know, they're more uh, equilibrated. So you can see that in, in these type of images. Yes, that's a really good point. So in this sample on the left, uh, this is a type six. So as I mentioned before, when you get to these type five, type sixes, the olivine grains are all equilibrated, which means they have the same composition for the most part. The same with the pyroxene. Because they have this, the same composition, they're the 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 z between all the olivine grains is going to be basically the same since it's the same composition but when you're looking at type threes where you've got for example you can have an olivine grain that basically has almost no iron in it and then on the outside of that grain it's rich in iron you'll actually see uh, a difference in the z color between the core of the grain and the rim so you can actually get uh, in type threes, you can actually see all sorts of Z contrast inside of a single grain of olivine or pyroxene or whatever phase you're looking at. So in the type sixes, it's very easy, at least to distinguish the phases, because if you see one color, it's probably gonna represent the same phase. But when you look at type threes, uh, you're, you can get a single phase like olivine that appears in every shade of gray. And the only way to really tell it apart is by making a chemical map or by just hitting all those different phases and seeing what the composition is. So it's this, so these images, these BSC images are really influenced a lot on the mineral chemistry. That's the number one thing that influences these. So basically compositional images. Yes. So I sort of showed this before. Uh, this is sort of going a little bit more into the, uh, the, re, the sort of the, um, the interactions between the electrons when they hit the sample. So here sort of, again, you have the electron beam going into the sample. So the sample's here. And essentially, like I said, they can either backscatter outwards. So they would go backwards this way, as this arrow is showing, or they hit the sample and they knock off an electron from an inside orbital out. The electron that gets knocked off from the sample is called a secondary electron. And like I said, it gets picked up by the secondary electron detector here. Now the interesting thing when that happens is that when you knock off the secondary electron, so this is sort of the same image here, an electron from an outer orbital shell with higher energy wants to go in and fill in the gap. It wants to fill in that missing electron that was launched out in order to uh, claim, in order to eventually to stabilize and go to the ground state. So it wants to get to the low energy state. And so when it replaces that electron that was blasted outwards, so this electron goes in to fill this electron, it releases an X-ray, sort of as energy. And depending on whether what element you're looking at, so if I'm looking at a magnesium atom or a silicon atom, the X-rays have characteristic wavelengths to them. So the wavelengths vary depending on what element you're looking at. Now, the good thing about having these x-rays that are different, depending on whatever element you're looking at, is that we can quantify these x-rays and we can turn those into compositional percents of however much of the element we have in our sample or combination of a certain elements in our sample. And for that, we have to use, we can use one of two detectors. Uh, in the scanning electron microscope, the more common one is the EDS detector, whereas in the electron microprobe, uh, the more common one used is the WDS detector. And I'm gonna go really cool, I'm gonna go into the differences between the two of them and what they both can do and the pros and cons. So here's an image again of the sample. So 
electron beam goes down, hits the sample, you let off secondary electrons, they get taken into the secondary electron detector, and now you have x-rays. And so those x-rays can get picked up in one of two ways. If we have an EDS detector, we have what's called uh, a crystal right here. And so this crystal picks up, it's usually I think a silicon crystal if I'm correct, and it usually, what it does is it picks up the wavelengths of all these elements. So it picks up the entire range of all the different element uh, wavelengths of these elements. And once they're inside, uh, those wavelengths get quantified and those turn into uh, an average uh, percentage or value of how much of the element you have in your sample. So if we look right here, we have the ES detector and let's say I hit a sample and I measure all these wavelengths, it can tell me the weight percent of copper in the sample because it's picking up those characteristic X-rays of copper. Now, the, the good thing about this is that if, let's say, for example, I hit the sample with this electron beam and I let it run for like 20 seconds, I'm going to get x-rays that are coming out for 20 seconds. And so I'm able to pick up a whole sweep of elements because, like I said, this detector picks up the entire, pretty much it can pick up the entire periodic table of elements and quantify them. The problem with doing so is that because you're picking up all sorts of wavelengths at the same time, you're prone to getting a lot of background issues. And you can get a uh, background noise. And what I mean by this is uh, your precision isn't really as good when you do this. So for example, if I'm just trying to see, let's say how much copper is in a sample. So again, uh, I pick up, for example, I do a lot of measurements and I can see that I've got a mean value of 100 weight percent copper in this sample. So this is like a pure copper sample here. But you can see how some of these grains are going upwards of 104% copper. Some of these grains go down to 94% copper. And you can see there's a deviation. So I've got a large range in my copper values. So the problem with the EDS is you can get a range in the values of some of the elements in your sample which is not good because if you're looking at elements that make up 0.1 weight percent of your sample, uh, you know, that, that precision uh, is not gonna be very good. So the reason why now I'm gonna go into the WDS detector is because this detector is a little different. And what this does is the WDS detector has a set of different crystals and these crystals are oriented at different alignments. And what they do is when the X-rays get launched off of the sample, so the sample gets hit by the electron beam, X-rays come out, uh, the WS detector has specific crystals in certain orientations where they can only pick up specific wavelengths. So instead of picking up all the wavelengths, you can designate a crystal to be in an exact spot and say, I just wanna pick up iron just the iron uh, x-ray. And so you, you can set the crystal where you only pick up iron and everything else is ignored. And the advantage of that is that those wavelengths that get picked up by the detector, those don't have as much interference or background noise as they would in the EDS since no other wavelengths are being picked up. So those aren't affecting uh, your results when you get them. And so if you look on the bottom screen, you can see what using a WS detector my range in my copper values is much more narrow. It's much more precise. So the WDS is very good. Uh, it's, it's much better than the EDS if you're trying to quantify, you know, how much of something you have in your sample. So a very good instance of this would be uh, if I was trying to figure out how much chromium I have in some of my olivines. I don't want to use the EDS detector because sure, I could get, uh, I can get chromium values that, you know, are correct, but I can easily get values that are much higher or much lower than what they really are. And that is an error with precision. So if I, if I wanna do really accurate work analyzing meteorite samples, I wanna use a WDS detector. It, it seems like to me, Daniel, that the, the EDS is more of a vacuum, so it gives you a shotgun effect, whereas the WDS is more of a you can control the angle by the crystal, so it gives you more of a sniper. The, the EDS is great if you're just trying to say, 
I've got this random uh, mineral grain or something, what's in it? And you just hit it and you can see all these peaks come up. It says silicon, magnesium, iron's in there. So it's good to know uh, qualitatively what's in there. You can use it semi-quantitatively, but you're prone to getting these errors, like these standard deviation errors. So for those, so when you're, if you're trying to do quantitative work, you pretty much want to exclusively stick to a WDS. Yeah. But one thing I found uh, when doing uh, meteorite classification of a lot of samples is that with your equilibrated ordinary chondrites, where your olivines are pretty much almost the same composition, your pyroxenes are almost the same composition, if you hit a large sample of grains, uh, your mean value is going to basically be roughly at or equal to what you would get if you would hit those grains with a WDS. So a lot of, uh, a lot of the meteorites you see in the meteorical bulletin, you sometimes see uh, that the classifier might have analyzed three or four grains and called it a type six, sometimes even two grains. So if, if you were doing this with an EDS detector, you might see, I think some of mine, I've hit 50 or 60 grains. But the average value of that is basically almost the same as if I hit two grains with a WDS. So I could use the EDS detector. It's a lot faster. The WDS detector is slow because you're only picking up one element at a time. So let's say I wanted to pick up 10 elements. I would have to pick up one, and then it would have to arrange the crystal, pick up another one. That's the difference. OK. Yeah. I was wondering if you had to change out the crystal, but you're at, you are changing the angle to you're, you're looking for a certain element. You're not just sucking up and reporting what you get no that you also sense. can have you also can have uh pre-arranged so like you can have four or five crystals in a microprobe using the wds at a certain orientation mm -hmm. so that way one picks up an element and then instead of having to move that one you just use a second crystal and then you start picking up a different element so you can do many things but whenever you hear someone using the microprobe and doing work they're using the wds okay so right right now what we're looking at this is microprobe analysis is that what is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. This is what I'm paying for. <laughs> no, I just want to make sure I know that what we're doing because I, I understand the thin section, but now the micro probe is actually the firing of, of the of the beam at the at the particle and at your sample and co collecting the particles either that backscatter off or are directed towards your crystal, looking for a certain uh, or a certain set of elements. The, the x-rays are the so the x-rays coming off of the sample are directed towards the wds or the eds you're right the, the electrons themselves uh when they hit the sample they're either bounced back into the backscatter detector or into a secondary electron detector so right. it's not the electrons themselves that you pick up and turn into quantitative measurements it's the x-rays thank you you should also say that wds requires standard counting whereas eds doesn't require yes. any standard yes. counting at all Yes, one of the. So, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, EDS is energy dispersive spectroscopy, and um, WDS is uh, wavelength dispersive yes. spectroscopy. Okay. That's a really good point on the standards. So, uh, when you're doing WDS work, a lot of times you're hitting standards first uh, before you hit the samples because. Uh, a lot of times you can get instrumental uh, precision errors that are different depending on the day you hit the sample or those can depend on the conditions or there are lots of things that can affect that. So there are what we call laboratory standards, which are specific, uh, specific, um, they are specific samples that have a definite composition that's been measured and averaged by multiple laboratories across the world that this is how much uh, silicon this has. This is how much magnesium this sample has. And so, for example, if we look on the bottom left, you can see I've got all these different standards. So what, I, what I've done is, uh, once I've gotten the analysis done, I, show, I pretty much put the analysis into a spreadsheet and I, I start off by analyzing my standards. So, for example, uh, for SiO2, I have what's called a Phthalite EMS1 standard. And so it basically, what, what this means is that I measure the standard using the WDS first, and I see, do I get the same result as what it actually is? Or if it deviates a bit, 
uh, how much does it deviate? And so I do the same for all those elements. I can use the same standard or I can use different standards. Sometimes it's good to use different standards, sometimes the same. And once I get, uh, once I've analyzed those standards, depending on how far they deviate from what their true value is, I have to apply a correction onto my actual data. Because if the standards aren't getting the exact value that I'm measuring as to what they should have, then whatever correction factor I, I have to normalize them by to get their true value, I have to do the same thing to the actual data, since that is the instrument, uh, instrumental precision error, if that makes sense. That, that's the calibration tool. Yes. Yeah, gotcha. Is there a lot of need to mess around with beam strength when you're doing it, or are you basically, is there some standard strengths that are kind of used when you're doing uh, classification? Uh, the, the normal settings when you're using an SCM or a microprobe are with the accelerating voltage. Uh, you want to keep that at about 15 to 20 kV. Uh, those, the reason why is it has to do a lot with um, when you're trying to uh, see uh, certain mineral phases in backscatter electron detection and also when you're trying to do microprobe work. Uh, you need to have a certain amount of accelerating voltage to pick up those x-rays as well. So that's something you can play around with. Another thing is the, um, I keep forgetting the word here. It has to, I think it's the, I think it's the beam current. And that the beam, is. Beam current is usually 20 nanoamps. Yeah. Yes, the beam current. So you can, you can do 20 nanoamps. That's usually standard with silicates. When you do plagioclase though, sometimes you want to lower that to like 10 nanoamps or you can defocus the beam. So. There, there are a lot of things you can play around with when you're using these instruments, and it's really tailored to what you're trying to do. If you're trying to look at organic, like uh, hydrocarbons or something, you want to have a very low accelerating voltage, a very low beam current. Whereas if you're looking at silicates, you can have 15, 20 kV accelerating voltage, and you can bump up your beam current. So it, it really depends what you're looking at. And so on the Thanks. there's a question in the chat. I'm just going to read uh, sure. the, the the sample current um, micro nanometer is uh, is to monitor current changes across the sample during the backscatter mode only. Changes across. Are they referring to the the, the beam current? Uh, it's uh, it's one of our. Uh, I think our Italian friends, so there may be a little bit of difficulty in translation, but they're asking about, is it only during the backscatter mode, that the sample current nanometer? Uh, the, beam, the beam current is actually, gives you the intensity of the x-rays. So the higher the beam current, the more counts you get, but you have to set the beam current to specific samples. So as, as Daniel says, um, you want a lower current for things that have got things like lots of sodium in them, because that burns up yes. under the beam. So, so basically, the, the setting of the beam current is specific for the actual sample. And to ensure analytical conditions are consistent throughout the analyses. Yes. Absolutely. Especially when, when you're dealing with samples and uh, volatile elements, uh, you want to have a low beam current. Since sodium, if you have a high beam current, uh, if you're hitting a, a grain of, let's say, feldspar, and you hit it for a long period of time with a focused beam, if you were to hit that same grain again, you would actually observe that the sodium content is less because you're actually burning off some of the sodium. I think the same with potassium think, and rubidium and some of those other volatiles. But, but definitely, it's, it depends on what sample you're looking at. And um, so on the right side, uh, I'm kind of missing a column here, but basically, this is sort of... Uh, this is sort of what you would see. So in this case, these are the normalized results. So these are normalized to 100 uh, weight percent. Some, for the most part, your analysis aren't going to be normalized to 100 weight percent when you get the results of all these different uh, oxides. But uh, it does a normalization after. So I'm only showing that part. Uh, it's missing SiO2. Uh, but these are basically olivines that I hit. So uh, SiO2 is around 40, 42-ish to 38. And Basically, this just tells me how much iron oxide I have in the sample, uh, how much magnesium I have in the sample, how much chromium I have in the sample. And so once I get this 
this uh, analytical data, now I can start figuring out, okay, what meteorite group am I in? I can start looking at what's the, uh, the phaolite, what's the phenoslite if I'm looking at pyroxene. I could say how much chromium is in the uh, iron rich olivines, and that can maybe give me a sense as to the subtype. I can uh, turn these oxide weight percents into molecular percent elements, and I could find out what's the iron manganese ratio, which is useful for chondrites. Uh, so there's many things you can do once you have the data. So once you have the data, now you can start making graphs, you can start making charts, and you can figure out what meteorite group you're looking at. How do you make sure that none of the material you're testing is cholesterol? Meaning um, you're, you're going deep into the sample, you're doing a thin section from within, so you're making sure there's no terrestrialization or no terrestrial contamination? There's, there's many things you can do. It, we usually, the, the main thing is um, when I send it to get a thin section, they, I tell them if they can give it a really good polish. So they polish a lot of the top of the surface off. So if, there, if any oxide veins or any weathering uh, veins or carbonates have penetrated into the sample, there's not much I can really do. But if um, it's only exterior, a lot of that gets removed in the polishing. Another useful thing is I can make chemical maps, for example, for like calcium uh, to keep track of uh, carbonates. I can also make one for iron. And I can, like for example, uh, I can see if we look at the, if we look back at the, the thin section here, if you see all these veins running here, yeah. these are actually uh, iron oxides. So these are iron oxide weathering veins. So since I can see them uh, in the BSC image, when I'm picking spots to analyze, I don't want to pick on the, I don't want to pick a point that's, you know, right under the, the vein. I want to hit somewhere that's relatively fresh. So it's sort of, you have to find the areas, hit them, and then could just I hope. That could I assume that the wider the veins, the more weathering? Uh, for, the, for the most part, if you see a lot more veins concentrated in one area, it could either be that that area was affected uh, preferentially uh, by the weathering, or it could mean that if you see it everywhere, the sample's been more extensively weathered than a sample that doesn't have as many veins. So you could say that. Gotcha. Okay. With different instruments, uh, so for example, um, if you're using a laser ablation system, you're basically you're basically making holes in the sample. And the spot size of those instruments are a lot bigger than this one. So with the microprobe and uh, the microprobe, your spot size is, let's say, at most uh, one micron. <laughs> Whereas when you're hitting with those large uh, laser ablation systems, those are like 25, 50, 100 microns. So your chances of getting contamination from the outside increases. So one of the good things of using a microprobe is it's a very low spot size. Daniel, how big is a micron? So in this case, uh, I don't have the scale on here, but I but this plagioclase grain is roughly 50 microns. So a micron spot would be, let's say, maybe like something like this. Well, I mean, what's the conversion between a micron and a millimeter? Oh, so a millimeter is a thousand microns. So a micron's very small. So like a chondral, for instance, is let's say 200, 300 micrometers in diameter. So in this case, this one's, let's say, uh, maybe like 800, that's 0.8 millimeters. So if we go from centimeters to millimeters, and then we go all the way to microns, it's a, it's a large uh, difference in size. Yeah. And there are specific SEMs, the, uh, the, or what, what I call T TEMs, transmission electron microscopes, that you can see resolutions down to nanometers. So these go even further. So the typical SEMs go to, I think, a couple of micrometers that you can see. But when you get to these TEMs, you can see much farther in, a uh, much uh, lower size. It's really cool. One of the other things you can do is you can make what are called uh, false color image chemical maps. So on the left, I've got a porphyritic uh, pyroxene chondral. And basically what I've done is I've taken the SEM image 
And then I ran what's called a chemical map over uh, this specified area. And this is with the EDS detector. So basically it hits all these points and it basically gives me an average uh, composition of each of the points. And this is, I think, per, per certain number of pixels. And what, what eventually happens is that I can sort of look at this image, I can set colors per element, and I can sort of say, I want magnesium to be green. So anywhere that's rich in magnesium is gonna show up green. So I can identify, these are the pyroxene laths. I can set certain areas, for example, I put aluminum in blue, so a lot of the blue areas here are either mesostasis material or they're rich in aluminum. And the exterior of the chondral just happens to be rich in calcium. I think this is mostly due to weathering. Uh, I think this is a weathering effect. A lot of uh, uh, chondrals are sometimes rimmed with carbonates. So, that's, so basically that, but the calcium can also be useful if I'm trying to say, do I have high calcium pyroxene present in the sample versus low calcium pyroxene. So you can set any elements you want. I could set silicon, I could set iron, I could set uh, titanium. So this is useful because like I was saying earlier, if you wanna know how weathered your sample is, you can, you, can set, you can set certain elements and you can see where the weathered areas are because those would show up rich in a certain element. Okay. How much uh, time do you spend on like accessory minerals for like a write-up? Um, it depends. I mean, if, if I'm looking at, let's say, uh, a CV3 and I'm trying to figure out if it's uh, oxidized uh, or reduced, or more specifically, if it's oxidized and I'm trying to figure out, does it contain sodalite or nepheline to be type A, or does it contain a lot of phyllosilicates, mm -hmm. then I would pay more attention. But if I'm just looking at a type 3 uh, chondrite, I wouldn't pay too much attention to accessory minerals. It really depends what I'm trying to look at. Yeah, thanks. And then on the right is, this is basically um, another false colored image map. So you can do it of meteorite samples as well. So you can pretty much do it of anything. So you can do it of individual phases or CAIs or the entire meteorite. So it's a very useful feature to have. And then we make it to other uh, analytical uh, data you can actually use to help a meteorite classification. So on the left, I've got, uh, it's a little hard to explain what's going on here, but uh, basically this is oxygen isotopes. So uh, Dr. Karen Ziegler, she does a lot of work uh, on oxygen isotopes and there's other facilities as well. And basically oxygen isotopes, sort of, you sort of think of, think of them as the fingerprint of where that meteorite might have came from. So uh, there, there are a lot of real, uh, there are a lot of plots that show all the different meteorite groups and what their oxygen isotopes are. And to put it in a very simple context, uh, oxygen isotopes, you can either think of them as sort of a spatial resolution as to where the meteorite parent bodies might have formed. You can also think of them as a temporal evolution as to what meteorite bodies might have formed first and what might have formed later. Uh, there's a lot of uh, research done on oxygen and oxygen isotopes. Um, the main reason you use them for meteorite classification is because there's so much work that's been done on existing meteorites of a certain group. So they get the oxygen isotopic data, and then you analyze an unknown meteorite, you get its oxygen isotopic composition, and depending on where it plots, if it plots in a field, so like for example, uh, these three X's are the unknown sample, they all plot in the LL field, then it seems likely that this sample is an LL chondrate. Now that's not always the case. There are samples where the oxygen isotopes plot in one field, and then you do microprobe work, and it tells you it's a meteorite from another, from another group. And those are the anomalous meteorites, and there's a lot of research done on those, and there's a lot of unknown asteroidal bodies that we might not have documented or other uh, planetary bodies. But basically, uh, oxygen isotopes are just a pretty useful way if you're trying to just narrow down, you know, am I really looking at this meteorite group or something else. So for chondrites, it's not the most necessary. I'd say this is mostly for achondrites like Martians uh, or, or other samples. I would imagine that would be helpful in lunar because lunar and terrestrial are so alike. Yeah, with lunar and terrestrial, those all fall on what's called the terrestrial fractionation line. So you can't really tell those apart. But in lunar meteorites, what's cool is that uh, the plagioclase and most of those uh, lunar meteorites, like the anorthocytic, uh, 
uh, rich uh, breccias and such and forth. They're extremely rich in calcium compared to uh, the plagioclases that you see on Earth. Mm -hmm. So that's one useful way of distinguishing uh, between the two of them is that they're just uh, those uh, plagioclases are just so high in calcium on the moon. And there's other uh, parameters you can use also, but that's just one way. Thank you. And then on the right, this is, um, this is a mass spectrometer. So these are very, very expensive instruments, but the data you get from these are probably the most precise uh, elemental or isotopic data that you get uh, compared to almost any other instrument. And so with these mass spectrometers, you can do bulk analysis, which is where you dissolve a sample in acid and you analyze it. And you basically can get uh, the elemental concentration of maybe 50 to 60 to 70 different elements. Uh, the, basically, you can use this for, if you're trying to look at trace elements like rare earth elements or um, elements that like uh, incompatible refractory elements like thorium, uh, zirconium, hafnium, tantalum. Uh, and you can also use this uh, for, if you're looking at, let's say, iron meteorites, you can look at the siderophile elements like cobalt, nickel, iridium, uh, palladium, platinum. And so this is, these are, this is very useful if, you're, if you really need to do trace element work of meteorites. So if you're trying to find out what iron group you're looking at chemically, uh, this is either this or the instrumental neutron activation analysis uh, instrument, either of those you can use but the mass spectrometer is just great at getting trace elements, whatever you're hitting. And so once you have all the data, uh, the last thing to do is actually fill out the form. So uh, the form is an Excel spreadsheet. You can download it from the Meteorical uh, Bulletin website. And uh, basically uh, the first part of it, uh, I mostly, or you mostly get from the collector. So uh, for example, what country the meteorite was found in, where it was purchased, or where the place was, or if it was found somewhere, you put what day it was found. If it's a fall, you'd say it's a fall. If it's not a fall, you don't put anything, latitude, longitude, the mass of the entire sample, you know, how many pieces, and then you put details like what's the class, what's the shock grade, sorry, the shock stage, the weathering grade. You can put the fail light, frost light, last night percentages, you can put the magnetic susceptibility data, and then you go into other things like the type specimen mass, the institution, the main mass holder. So in this case, this meteorite uh, is an is a LL 3.15 that Fabian couldn't send to me, and basically this is all the info put in. Uh, you'll see at the top in the upper left uh, for the proposed name, if it's an NWA sample, there are so many NWA numbers right now that you, you, you can't go to Metpool and find out which was the last number there and then put the next number. You have to leave it blank because there are so many meteorites that are just pending and haven't been approved that they're assigning number, NOMCOM is assigning numbers as they're approving the samples. So if you're doing an NWA sample, you leave it blank. If you're doing, let's say, a fall where you have the town or you have whatever uh, place that the meteorite fell in, then you put in the name or if you have GPS coordinates, uh, wherever it's near, you put the name for that too. But with the NWA samples, you leave it blank. And then at the end, uh, this is just a basic write-up. So you can write about uh, the sample, you can discuss the petrology. So what you see in thin section, you can talk about the geochemistry. And then at the end, you just write up the class. So what meteorite group you think it belongs to. And then you just put your name as the submitter. And then once that's done, now you submit it to the NOMCOM committee. And basically, a lot of people were asking me earlier about who the NOMCOM is and who's a part of it. And if you go on the Meteorological Society website, you can actually find out who are the members of NOMCOM. And so these are all the current members right now. And also a part of NOMCOM, well, not, not part of NOMCOM, but the uh, two people that run the database are Jerome Gattaseka. He runs the submissions and he works with NOMCOM. And Dr. Jeff Grossman runs the database. So he edits the database. He inputs all the new approved meteorites. And basically, whenever you submit, uh, whenever you submit the form for approval, uh, the approval process take, can take anywhere from days to weeks to months. What happens is NOMCOM receives the Excel spreadsheet you submitted. And they take a look at all the 
data that you found for the sample, your, your explanation for what the meteorite group is. And they also take a look at, uh, you know, where the sample is found, what the name is. They want to know if it's, if you have GPS coordinates for the sample, they want to make sure that the name is correct towards where it fell in. They also want to make sure that uh, your, your data matches up with what your classification is. So if I, for example, have, if for example, the data I got from the microprobe tells me it's an LL and I call it an H, uh, NOMCOM is going to prove that sample because it's not correct. So everything you submit in that report has to be correct. And it's going to go through a heavy uh, screening process. So everyone in the committee, I, I think it's, um, I'm not sure if it's majority vote or if everyone has to approve on it. But what I do know is if anyone doesn't approve on it, they offer suggestions that you have to either revise your submission or you have to answer their comments. So on a lot of samples, I've gotten comments asking uh, why I labeled such and such meteorite to have this mineral phase in it. And then I said it was this as a result of that. So if you, as long as you clarify yourself in your submission and you clarify the sample and why you think it's that way, uh, you shouldn't have problems assuming you did the classification correctly. And so. So it's basically like submitting a paper to any journal, basically. Pretty much, yeah. You submit it, they review it. If, and while they're reviewing it, you get a submission link. So in that submission link, it tells you if your sample is pending, if your sample is uh, tabled. When it's tabled, that means that you've gotten comments back and you have to revise it and send it again or if it's rejected, which means they flat out reject it and you either have to resubmit it again as something different. But normally when it's rejected, it's either because what you've submitted uh, does not have the, it, it normally, from what I've experienced, it has to do with the fact that the name that you give to the meteorite is not something they want to approve of. So it has to do a lot of times with the name, but sometimes it has to do with uh, the data itself. So you can either, so, it can either be rejected, it could be approved, or it could be tabled. Now, once uh, you get the approval status, they send you a message saying status of this job, dear submitter, and then they tell you the following meteorites have been approved. And then once they approve it, they give you the number. So if it's an NWA meteorite, they give you the number, the approval date. And then as soon as they approve it, once Metpool gets updated, which could be either the same day or up to a week later, then you see the submission in the database. So sometimes you can have samples that are approved and then you don't see them online until a week later because you have to update the website. So that's basically in a, in a whole, the, the full process uh, on average when you get a meteorite sample and you go to submit it in. So a couple of things I'd like to say before I uh, give it up to the Q&A part. Um, I'm very thankful to all the collectors that sent me samples, uh, to all uh, the other meteorite scientists that I've worked with and collaborated with. Uh, Anthony has helped me a lot on some of, uh, on one of our submissions that we worked on, that was the 3.5, which was the first one approved in three years, first NWA approved in almost seven years. So that was a really uh, cool collaboration we had. I'd like to thank uh, George Peniff. He sent me a, a very unique sample that ended up being a Black Beauty pairing, which, I would have no idea. I that would that completely uh, surprised me when I got the sample at the time. You know, holding a piece of Black Beauty, so that was something yes. interesting. And I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Alan Rubin. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of times, you know, when I started off, I had so many questions. Even today, I have so many questions when I get a sample and I have trouble identifying it. And Alan knows so much about meteorites, and he's done a lot of work in classification. So I highly encourage anyone who happens to be, who visits California or, or Los Angeles to visit UCLA's uh, meteorite collection. They have an amazing collection. I think it's the largest on the West Coast. And uh, they're always uh, so involved in meteorite science. So uh, before I quickly, sorry, one more thing. Before I quickly go into um, uh, the q and I just wanted to talk about really briefly on just a couple projects I have planned. Uh, uh, for anyone noticing this, uh, this is either a macrochondral or a uh, igneous clast. I have yet to tell. Um, I received this slice about two years ago and I put it in the SEM, but it was too big to look at. And I didn't get a thin section of this at the time. So one of my projects I plan on doing is making a thin section of this, getting an oxygenized topic 
uh, data from the con this chondral, megachondral or igneous clast and just trying to figure out where it comes from. So it's, it's just something very interesting. Another thing I have is this is, uh, this is um, a sample of the poikilitic uh, shergatite that's been going around. I made a thin section of this and I plan on analyzing with the microprobe soon. You're saying placolytic rather than the herzolytic? So I, I initially was saying lertolytic, but then I asked Tony Irving and he corrected me and he said the right term is poikilitic. Uh, he, he told me because the term lertolytic implies uh, a complete cumulate origin, but one of the papers he worked on in 2012 uh, sort of argues against this sort of cumulate origin, but it's, it's debated in the community, but the, the safe term that, that I was told to use is poikilitic. So okay. awesome. I'm just sticking with that term. But if you use okay. lertolytic, there's nothing wrong. It's just, just a, it's, it's sort of as if you use basalt, basaltic as a textural versus compositional term. It's gotcha. something All right. like that. And then this sample right here was, donate, was donated to me by University of Alicante by Juan Poblador. It's a 10 pound uh, beautiful fresh sample. And I plan on uh, receiving another small piece to cut and classify that's paired to this. So that's another thing. Juan is a great guy. Oh, he's he's amazing. I love working with him. He has such he has such interesting samples, and he's doing a lot of work on his website uh, where he sells a lot of unique samples. And we yeah. have a interesting uh, collaboration now. A lot that's of great. That's great. And uh, just really briefly. Uh, I had a talk scheduled uh, in the fall in uh, LPSC that was unfortunately canceled due to the pandemic. And my research that I'm doing just focuses on looking at chondrules and I'm, I'm analyzing them using the laser ablation ICP. So I'm just taking a look at trace elements within chondrules of type threes. So that's mostly my research. If anyone wants to discuss that further and message or something, you can always ask me. And with that, I'm gonna go to Q and A. And thank you. Is that a smiley face? Yes. So this, <laughs> this, this, I encounter all sorts of crazy things when I look at meteorites and thin sections. I've encountered smiley faces. I've encountered an object that looks like a skull. I've encountered an object that looks like a heart, an object that looks like a kid holding a bowling ball. I've encountered all sorts of crazy chondrules and crazy things in uh, SEM. So I've got all sorts of interesting uh images nice well daniel first off on behalf of the of the meteorite club and toe for spin meteorites i really want to thank you for your time today and it's it's very rare to have a scientist of, of your caliber uh you know take his time out to educate us and, and spend time with us and you've been on a few of our hangouts and i totally appreciate that so this collaboration, uh, I'm glad it worked out. I'm glad you were able to make your time available for us first off. So thank you. Thank you. I definitely learned. Yes, absolutely, lot. Daniel. It's been wonderful to uh, to hear you work work through this stuff and uh, uh, allowing us to learn a little more here and there. Um, so I had a question about. So I, I sent you a type sample of 29 point something grams. Um, and then another slice, but that other slice is not really homogeneous. There's part of it that has, you know, very round chondrules and part of it that has distorted chondrules. Um, how do you go about, you know, I wanted, I wanted to, to submit a slice that showed kind of all the variation in the meteorite, but how do you go about trying to decide which of those pieces to choose? Or do you just go for this two inch by three inch thing and get everything? Uh, it, it really depends. Um, so I, I could technically go a general route and just say type three contains abundant chondrules and such and such. But if I want, I can also go more in depth and say that, uh, for example, I can say uh, this meteorite contains different textures. Uh, for example, if you said there's a bunch of deformed chondrules, I can say, uh, if it's a cluster chondrite texture, and I can also say that uh, certain parts of it, uh, for the most part, are um, uh, contain uh, round chondrules. So there, I can also, if it, if your sample has certain areas of it that might be brecciated, so if you might see some clasts in your type three, I can say there are some clasts present as well. 
but it, it depends how far you really want to go. So let's say, for example, if there are classes in the sample in one slice, but they're not in another, and if you want me to, let's say, analyze both slices and then get the composition of those classes, see how it compares with the lithology of the main uh, chondrite, I could technically do that. Normally, though, if you're just doing a classification, uh, there's no need to go that far in depth. It's usually if I was doing like a research project on the sample and I wanted to figure out, you know, how that, uh, how that meteorite accreted on its parent body or how the class might have gotten there, sort of the history of that sample, I could, that's more what I would do that for. But in a, in a classification, I would more so analyze the section that I'm given and then say in the section that, that I analyzed, it contained this texture and this lithology and this. But if you have other images of it, I can also mention those and say what the texture appeared in those. So it, it really depends okay. on how much you want to, to look at. Yeah, the, the specific thing I wanted to do with this one, and I think it was kind of you know, your request kind of uh, matched up with, with my interest, is to see how low it goes, 3.10, 3.05, 3.20. Um, and uh, so I guess I, I'm, I'm asking if you'll look at the slice and, you know, just visually under the microscope and, and try and decide what part of it might be the most primitive or might be the least weathered, uh, or what what other um, uh, selections there are to try and find the most primitive part of it. For for the for the subtyping, uh, normally what's done is let's say for example there are different parts of the sample. Let's say if it's all the same lithology, let's say roughly the same texture, there can be certain parts of it that if you look at one chondro versus another, you could have one that that uh, texturally and compositionally, it resembles something of a higher petrologic grade than the other one, like small differences. So if I'm looking at type 3.15 versus 3.10 versus 3.2, if I, the best thing to really do is get an average of all the different, uh, let's say if I'm looking at all of the ingrains that are iron rich, I can look at the chromium values and all those, average them, and then see what the standard deviation is. If I just go with the ones that are, let's say, that have the highest chromium concentrations, I'm sort of giving a false representation because I'm not accounting for the other portion of the sample. And then if someone wants to do right. research on the sample and they think it's a 3.10, but if you average the whole thing, it's more like a 3.2, that could affect their results and you know such and such. So it's important yeah. that the best thing to really do is hit as many grains as I can. So throughout the entire sample, right. getting all the different textures, average them, and then see what it is, and then where it most likely plots. So it's more of the bulk meteorite scale rather than an individual class. I could, if I was making a research project, go into, let's say if you have a type five, uh, let's say you have a, an H5, but it contains a class of something that's like 3.2 in there. I could do a research project right. on that class, but the overall uh, classification would be type five. Okay, yeah, well, I'm not trying to cook the number or anything, but um, I think this one has the potential to be a real primitive one, and I just want to make sure that there isn't something like uh, weathering that you mentioned that could obscure uh, the measurement of what it really is. Oh, for the weathering? And, uh, and, yeah. yeah. And, and, and on this one, I don't care how much time it takes in the microprobe, uh, however much time it takes to analyze lots and lots of grains is perfectly fine with me. Sure. Normally, I, I personally as as, like... Yeah. As long as you have the time. I personally like hitting a lot of grains. Uh, I personally like hitting 30 to 40. I prefer that over hitting 10 to 20. It's It just, I guess it depends on the person, but my preference, do you, do you I prefer do, to hit a lot of grains. Do you do this one by one or do you plug, plug the positions in and just let it run overnight? Or? It depends. Uh, before I used to do it one by one, but then I realized it's easier to set the coordinates and then let it run. So you can do that with olivine and then change it, do it for pyroxene. But the problem with that is if I put too many grains in at once, and then let's say I'm trying, let's say I think a sample is a 3.1, and then I'm seeing that it looks more like a 3.8 or like a 3.9, there's no real reason for me to get that many grains since if I know it's not a low subtype, it's not worth getting 40, 50 grains. So I like to do 10 at a time and then see what I get. And then if I'm seeing an average that's 
close to a low sub type, I get 10 more and then I go from there. But usually I, I set the coordinates to 10 grains and let it run. Do you have a feel that there's a push not really to do anything above like a 0.2 or above anymore? Because there's a lot of data out there on them and that's not where the focus is anymore on research or? It's more so that um, in the past from a lot of the submissions I've looked at uh, in the past on the Miracle database, a lot of those estimated 3.4s, 3.5s, 3.6s for the most part were estimated between looking at the sample in uh, thin section and seeing if the mesostasis is devitrified or not and, and uh, the matrix material, if it's recrystallized and then they look at the chromium measurements in the olivine and they try to compare the two and estimate. Uh, the NOMCOM recently has gone a lot more strict on that. So anything above uh, 3.2, unless you have a lot of other kinds of data that you can use, like for example, cathodoluminescence luminescence data, like uh, Anthony does a lot of work on that, or if you have thermal luminescence data, uh, that can help you get the subtypes 3.3, 3.4, 3.5. But scientifically speaking, uh, most of the samples analyzed are mostly 3.2s and under, since anything above that, it's not really something a lot of researchers are interested in. Daniel, why is it that the Meteoritical Society asks collectors to donate 20% or 20 grams? You know, I, I think it, I don't know the full history on that, but my guess would be that uh, it's, it's more so, I guess you have certain collectors that they want to know if their sample is, I think more in the past, now that we have more samples, I think it's a little different. But let's say in the beginning, uh, you have a collector, let's say that, let's say there's, very few Martian meteorites available to scientific institutes. And the collector has a sample, it's a rare Martian meteorite, and they wanna get it classified, but they wanna keep it all to themselves or they don't wanna give any to scientific institutions. The reasoning why I think the 20% or 20 grams came about is because the trade-off is the collector gets the sample classified, they keep the main mass, but in exchange, they donate a piece to scientists that we can study or keep in our, uh, um, repositories and use later on for research if need be. Because if we didn't have that rule, we wouldn't have, you know, stuff like Summer Kona or Black Beauty in our collections as much because people, collectors want to keep all that stuff. So that's, that's my guess. You wouldn't be able to go back and discover 801 has sugars in it. The type specimens are really important scientifically. So if any collector needs to donate 20%, I highly recommend not to, not to give the weathered end cut piece because if we were trying to do research on it later, we want at least a piece that might be a little pristine, not something that's very weathered, so. I think from Nininger's books, that 20 grams or 20% goes all the way back to the beginning. Oh yeah, it's, it's Way beyond my time, way beyond my time. <laughs> 1930s, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Do we have any other pressing questions for our guest speaker today? We have some stuff in the, the, the chat. I don't know if any of these were questions or... I think we got all those. <clears throat> What's the hardest um, part of the whole process for you? For me, uh, I'm always learning. Um, you know, when I when I got Black Beauty uh, a year ago, I never classified a Martian meteorite, so uh, I didn't know, you know, what the correct iron manganese values were, what the right uh, mineralogy was of the sample. So I did a lot of research ahead of time, reading articles uh, by the UNM group and other institutes, reading up on what I should expect to find in this. And I, so there's always something, you know, that you learn, uh, you know, like for example, I can't, I don't know the last night um, value for pyroxenes from uralites off the top of my head, but there are a lot of research papers out there that have these. So it's sort of, it's sort of more that you narrow down the number of groups and you 
have, of course, tools that aid in classifying into the different groups. But I think it's essential that you don't have to know everything exactly, but it is good to do as much research as you can on the different meteorite groups since, you know, tomorrow there could be some new meteorite group that we don't know about. And then, of course, you know, 10 to 12 more years of research, you know, samples from Bennu will come back eventually, you know, first samples from Mars, Hayabusa samples. So there's a lot we don't know. Talking about that, what would be your dream sample, your dream specimen, your dream confirmation, like NWA 7325 Mercury, <laughs> something like that. Let's go big. What, what's, your, what's your grandiose dream? Oh, I don't know. Uh, probably, you know, I'll, my favorite meteorite groups, to be honest, are the, very, are the most primitive uh, chondrites. So I'd say a 3.00 is something interesting. But if it had to be from some other body that was collected, uh, probably something, something from uh, some unknown asteroidal body that we don't have samples from. So maybe some new chondrite group or something like that. And after Black Beauty, everything is kind of out. <laughs> you start out with Black Beauty, well, you're going to go downhill from there. Nail the second orthoperoxenite from Mars. <laughs> yeah, well, but Daniel, if my sample turns out to be a uh, LL 3.00, we can kill two birds with one stone there. I, I hope so. I hope so. And if, if Anthony's interested, maybe this could be another collaboration. I don't know if you might be interested. We can maybe work on this one, if, if something, maybe. Yeah, if, yeah, if it's looking good. We can send you photos. Well, you, yeah, mentioned sure. two, you mentioned two on your microscope. You were interested in reflected light, uh, just yeah. regular reflected or reflected cross-polarized? So reflected, uh, so it reflected and... Um, transmitted. So it's a dual uh, petrographic scope. And the reasoning this is useful is because since you can't see metal or sulfides under, you know, under transmitted light, the reflected light lets you see those. So it's much better at telling the weathering grade. And you can also, for example, I can see shock effects like uh, troy light grains inside of the metal. I can see, um, you know, it, in general, it's good to have both. Uh, Alan Rubin uses both. So that's one reason he's able to do a lot of the shock characteristics, chromite plagioclase assemblages, you can see those using both together, so. Okay, because there is a reflected cross-polarized light where you illuminate the sample with one polarization and you look at it through an analyzer at 90 degrees to that, and it, it cancels out the surface reflection. But yeah, what, yeah, what you're talking about is just basic, uh, uh, basic light from, from the top, reflected light, to be able to look at the, the opaque uh, phases. Well, you can also use the uh, cross-polarized reflected light to determine whether you're looking at sulfides like pyrotite versus troilite. You can see different deformation features in troilite that aren't visible in just regular reflected light. Sorry, Daniel. Hmm. Oh, no, no, no. That, that's really interesting. Uh, are there any papers on that? Yeah. Check out some of Alan's work. He talks okay. about polycrystal and troilite and you, uh, just regular interference of um, reflected light to look at different sulfide phases. And Anthony, while, uh, while you're here and I have you as my captive audience, on behalf of the Meteorite Club, I'd like to invite you to be one of our guest speakers one time. You and I can work out a subject on the side, but I know that you are very active and very knowledgeable. We can all benefit from that. So just something to that think about. That means I got to come up with something intelligent to say. No, you just got to make yourself available <laughs> to answer stupid questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, you could discuss um, maybe CL or other characteristics like that. You've done a lot more work than I have in CL and especially with other the the group that we have here is i mean we're to have daniel and, and anthony on on with us is very special we're, those are scientists and, and we we want to hear your experiences but we also want to make sure we keep it uh it level-headed so anyone is not intimidated to join and, and listen in and they can get <clears throat> good information so anything you have anthony from a ground level on up 
We'd like to hear it, whether it's you know a personal experience or if it's educational, like, like Daniel's presenting to us today. Just it's an offer on the table. Just we can connect off offline, okay? I'll see what I can put together, and I'll be in touch. Love it, love it. Yeah, don't listen to Topher. We want to hear all the nerdy stuff. More science, <laughs> more science. <laughs> <laughs> well, we we can the main presentation will be thousand foot view, and then after the first hour and a half, and only the nerds are left, then we can then we can just start digging. <laughs> um, anyone else have any uh, any pressing questions that they'd like to have Daniel answer? Well, I I really do appreciate Daniel making yourself available for us today, Daniel Shake. Thank you. Um, and uh, he's classifying two meteorites for me right now. I'm super pumped about those. Looking for a little something. Everyone wants a little something special. Like, yeah, I know it's a Ukrite, but is it a super <laughs> rare Ukrite? You know, I know it's Mars, but is it Black Beauty Mars? I'm hoping my Ukrite's something special. But if, hey man, it's a glossy, sexy little black Ukrite. So I'm, I'm, I'm satisfied with it. We got some. Uh, palisites out there for you. There was one question that I wanted to ask. So. Sure. Uh, anyone else can feel free to think of a question while I'm asking this and being answered, and then we're going to part ways. But my question to you is, is about pairing. Um, an example is the palisites I just sent you are very reminiscent of the golden palisite, which doesn't exist. There's no such thing as the golden palisite. There is one classified, and it's supposed to be golden palisite, but it's a very limited total known weight. So my question to you is, how can, like, let's just use the Golden Palisade for an example. How can I get this classification either paired to that one or have other ones paired to mine as being, like, let's just call mine the Golden Palisade if it is. Do you look through the Met Bowl for a similar classification from a similar area with similar chemistry and go, well, that's obviously a pair, so we're gonna pair it. That seems like a really manual process and I don't see that happening organically. So I'm not really sure how, let's just say the Ukrite that I got to you, let's say four other people have four other scientists working on it at the exact same time. How is that ever brought together in unison to create not for individual meteorites, but for paired main masses. That's a that's a really great question, Topher. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, so, to answer the palisite question first, uh, in terms of that, for example, uh, if if there are, let's say, for example, if I'm trying, if I get the sample and I do basic microprobe work of the the olivine that's not really gonna help me much in pairing it with other palisites. So what I would need to do is I would have to do uh, ICP work or trace elemental work on the metal. I would have to see what the, I would have to see, you know, is it main group? Is it Eagle station grouplet? I'd have to see stuff like that. But even then it's, it's an or oxygen isotopes. It's still kind of difficult to really pair fines together. I mean, it's possible, but it's very difficult and NOMCOM does not really recommend it. So that's why they give different NWA numbers. They do say, for example, if you have the same meteorite and let's say you send it to two, two different classifiers, one classifies it as this, one classifies it as this, even if it's the same thing, if they both send their results into NOMCOM, they both get published, they're two separate NWA numbers. They could technically write that likely paired to this, likely paired to this, and they'll pair them together. But in terms of going through the database and finding other palisites, it's a possibility, but you'd have to do a lot of work, trace elemental work, and you might even have to do a lot of oxygen isotope, not, not oxygen, uh, just isotopic work in general. You might even have to do nucleosynthetic uh, isotopic work if you really want to get that, you know, pairing down. So sometimes it's worth it. With falls, obviously, if there's a fall and there's all sorts of samples that get sent to different people, it's easy to pair those, and NOMCOM allows you to increase the main mass of those falls, or the total mass, sorry. But with fines, it's recommended you make uh, different NWA numbers and try to pair them. So, And, and a follow-up question to that. For the, let's just use an example where 
there's a, a diagonite and I make a move on it, but I can't purchase all of it. And I know that there's a, a two kilo block out there. I find out later on after I've classified my, my diagonite that, um, hold on a second. I find out later on after I've classified my diagonite that the, the person that purchased the other block of diagonite is now getting his classified. My nature is to reach out to someone to have the record updated that his would be paired to mine. Is that scientifically important? So I actually had that very same issue with a different sample. Uh, so a collector sent me 20 grams of something and then two months later he had another 2000 grams of the same thing. But by that time, the first 20 grams were approved as the total mass of NWA, whatever the number is. The problem is I contacted Dr. Jeff Grossman. I contacted Jerome Getaseka. They will not budge on increasing that total mass to include the other 2000 because it's, it, when, when I sent in the submission at the time, it only had those 20 grams. So I could technically classify the other one as a different NWA number, pair them together and say, these are paired together, but they have different NWA numbers because the mass of one is limited at, at 20 grams. So the other grams have to be under some different one. And, and speaking from not only a, a dealer's perspective, but obviously from a collector um, point of view, <clears throat> Um, cause I've been, I've been burnt on this. I thought I was buying the main mass to at Howardite. I did all the research. I knew on the nomcom exactly how much weight there was. I tracked down every single slice. I counted for cutting loss and I was four grams off from having the main mass. And I pulled the trigger on it just to find out, oh yeah, the nomcom that's old. There's, I have another two kilos sitting behind me. It's like, come on now, that that doesn't do. And I'm not I'm not giving you Daniel a hard time. I'm just saying in general, it, it it's hard as a collector to know the true weight is the true weight and value my purchase of a certain percentage of that known meteorite when that known meteorite is vague and up in the air and even when known won't be updated. That's a struggle that I think meteorite collectors have. And I think the most recent example of that was that poikilitic shergatite. That was, I think a lot of people had it was from Adrar and there are a lot of different collectors that have that. Anthony has a piece. I have a piece of a different one from someone. And there's another different piece that's going to be sent to me. And I think Tony Irving had a piece and Carl Agee had a piece and they're probably Either some of them are going to get paired because uh, they're from similar sources. They're basically from the same source. Or they'll all just go in as their own NWA numbers, but some will be paired. But they, they, none of those are going to be able to fall under the exact same NWA number as a result. So uh, you're, going to have, think, yeah, go you're going to have a bunch of different main masses of smaller samples of basically the same material, which is something that me and Anthony are actually thinking maybe we should do bulk trace elemental analysis of both of our samples, see how well they match up, and then maybe try to get a definite pairing or something of that sort. So That'd be phenomenal. Yeah. yeah. But it sounds like a big, big data mining exercise is required through the whole of Metbo. You get a pile of undergraduates to do that as a dissertation project or something. <laughs> in, and that's one of the challenges is the data is relatively limited within classification because really you just want to know what kind of rock it is. It's not, is this rock the same rock from that fall? Is it a different variant of this rock type? It's what is this rock? That's the question that we as classifiers are set to answer. That, that makes sense. And I, and you know, that's why we have you here from a scientific point of view. Um, and I'm not saying this is a big problem. I'm just saying it, it lends itself to, to a problem where you have the same Lahirzolitic shergatite going around. Basically you have, let's say four classifiers working on the same material from Adar. Everyone has it. It's all going to be classified. It's going to have four different numbers, four different main mass holders. Then 
now everyone's going to start saying, is it paired to 1950 or is it paired to this NWA or this and or it's paired to all four of these NWAs? There's this whole confusion that's set out on the market. So it's best, I think, as a as a, a reseller or even as a consumer a collector to understand that if you're buying this material, you have to educate yourself what material we're talking about. But if you're buying this material, just know that you, unless you're buying it from the main mass holder, don't trust any NWA number. I think that's fairly safe to assume that they're just putting a number on it and they're self pairing. It is what it is. It's a Martian Lahersolytic Shergatite from Adar. It is what it is. It doesn't necessarily need to have an NWA number on it unless you're buying it from that main mass holder. That's my, if, my point of view. If you buy anything, for example, if you search up the NWA number and the main mass is 30 grams and you're buying something from that person that's, let's say, more than 30 grams, that's not a good sign. Or if, you know, if there's only 10 grams of this certain number of meteorite and you're getting 20 grams of something paired to it, that's not to say that it isn't the same thing, but uh, I wouldn't personally, I wouldn't call that that NWA number. I would call it unclassified potentially paired, but you need someone to look at it and then that will get its own NWA number potentially paired to the sample. Yeah. But I wouldn't uh, call something. The, the difference is um, lab paired versus, and I don't mean this to be offensive in any way, um, Africans in a hut pairing. Let, let's be honest with you, it all rolls uphill. It eventually ends up in one conglomerate where they're picking through, they're, they're sorting it out and okay, these are all the Mars and let's go ahead and sell these. Um, and everyone's picking from the same bucket. I think that's something that, isn't that what happened with Black Beauty? That there were multiple, I, I think there were multiple people that picked, picked sources and then different collectors got certain yeah. pieces. So we have 17 uh, paired Black Beauty samples yeah. as a result. Yeah, and that's the problem you run into. It, sh it should be as singular as possible. Science to me, is, it should be as focused as possible. If there is one fall of Black Beauty in that one area, I don't care how many subsequent NWA numbers, they should all point back to the original and that original should have them, I don't know, maybe I'm pontificating, but that should have, a, all the mass should be known because when you go to buy something and you think, based on what information is available to me, I'm making a wise decision. Then you realize, oh, the information, that's totally, eh, that's years old. No one's updated that. Or worse, it was entered lower than expected to, in, in, to increase the value. I think if, if let's say, like for example, the auction isotopic data of, of Black Beauty, it's basically in its own category. So all the other pairings to Black Beauty, you can say these are paired to that one, but if there's another uh, polymix Martian breccia that comes in that's not Black Beauty, and then you're trying to pair that to that or something, then it gets even more complicated. So I think the only sense besides falls that you can maybe apply that pairing thing to, of course, when you have isotopic data or trace limit data or something, are specific meteorites that have certain outliers to them that you can find. But with generic uh, chondrites and especially with Northwest Africa DOCs, uh, equilibrate chondrites, you, yeah. you have to treat each one like its own number. Yeah. Well, when I run the world. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, everyone, uh, I don't want to cut anyone off. Does anyone have any final questions for our for Daniel? I will take that three second pause as a no all right that's five seconds daniel again thank you so much for your information thanks for joining us um you. you were you were very gracious in uh in accepting my invitation and working with me to make sure that the information that you would offer would be advantageous and something that would be digestible for our group so totally appreciate that um these are weekly hangouts that we do on behalf of the meteorite club and toe for spin meteorites. So I really hope that people watch the replay, learn as much as possible, digest as much as possible, and then engage in conversation, asking questions what you don't understand because we'll be here to answer whatever questions we can. And uh, I got Daniel on speed dial.
<laughs> Thanks, guys. Everyone have a good evening, okay? Thanks for joining good night, us. Nice, Stouffer. Have a good night. Good, good job, Daniel. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you so much. Thanks, Daniel. Good night.